Hey guys, Sean here, and I'm dead sure to tell you that today's video is brought to you by Squarespace, which is just a little bit awesome. Tell you more about that now in a bit. Sometimes the casting director gets an order to say, look, bring someone in for one week and that'll be the end of that. And the actor might turn around and go, haha, good luck to you. With that in mind, I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are 10 one-off Star Trek characters who never left. Number 10. Rom. Max Grudenchik was cast an emissary under the slightly unassuming character name of Ferengi Pitboss. This unnamed grunt who worked for Quark would eventually rise to become the Grand Nagus of the Ferengi Alliance, not bad for a day player. Grudenchik had appeared in Star Trek before, he'd even appeared as a Ferengi before, playing Sovak in the Next Generation episode Captain's Holiday. While the Ferengi Pit boss was a tiny role, affording him very little to do, the producers combined what they saw in him during the filming of Emissary, what they had seen from his previous performance. In a way, it's thanks to the character of Nog that Grudenchik was spared from the day player pile. Nog was always envisaged as a Ferengi youth who would befriend Jake Sisko while also being Quark's nephew. That left space for Nog's father to appear. The role went to Grudenchik, who was named Rom, and eventually appeared in dozens of episodes after this. Whenever quite making main cast designation, Grudenchik was one of Deep Space Nine's many, many recurring guests over seven years. Number 9. Admiral William Ross When Barry Jenner first heard of the role of Admiral Ross, he pursued it with a vengeance. He wasn't interested in doing what he described as a technically proficient audition, one that might suit a read-through but not display any real depth to the character. Instead, he took the script and developed an entire backstory. He saw Ross as a soldier, one who had risen up through the ranks while watching lots of friends lose their lives. This, Jenner felt, was key to the building blocks of his personality. Unlike many of the other admirals in Star Trek that they had previously shown, this man truly understood war. He got to work on A Time to Stand, and it was in working with Avery Brooks that he began to get the hint that he would be returning to the role. He told Brooks that he was only there for the day, while Brooks assured him it was far more likely that he would be there for the long haul. Once the producers saw his performance, they sided with Brooks and quickly wrote more scenes for Ross to appear in. In all, Admiral Ross appeared in 12 episodes of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, making him the Starfleet Admiral to have had the most appearances without changing rank along the way. Like a certain Admiral slash Captain Kirk. Number 8. Ro Laren. Michelle Forbes has a very interesting story with Star Trek. Ro Laren, the ensign who rose to lieutenant, only to join the Maquis, was not her first role in the franchise. Instead, she appeared a season earlier in the episode Half a Life, playing the daughter of David Ogston Steers, Dr. Timison. Though the part was small, she impressed the producers and she was invited back for the role of Ro Laren. She was a brash, insubordinate Bajoran ensign. She was also the first Bajoran seen on screen. This allowed Michael Westmore to base the makeup for this race on her image, opting not to hide her under too many prosthetics. A simple ridged nose with a small V above was complemented by a decorative earring, something Riker immediately told her to remove. Her first episode was all about the character, though it could have been the end for her as Ro Laren wasn't originally intended to be a recurring character. Then, after Forbes delivered her performance, she was invited back again and again, culminating in her promotion and defection in the penultimate episode of the next generation, Preemptive Strike. Number 7. Harcourt Fenton Mudd. Harry Mudd was devised by writer Stephen Candle and was originally proposed to be part of the second pilot for Star Trek. Candle felt that the cold and alien Telosians had put audiences off, so he wanted to bring in a character who was human, who was a swindler, who was the con man that set up shop as the Wizard of Oz. Candle, after having created the character, was then given one of Gene Roddenberry's original pitch ideas for Star Trek, titled The Women, to develop. He quickly combined this character with that script. He had effectively created a space pimp who was renting out intergalactic hookers. William Shatner would later recall that he marvelled at the fact that NBC allowed the episode to be made at all. Candle recalled that Roger C. Carmel was delighted with the character, truly enjoying embodying him. Set against this, as the years went by, Work started to dry up for him, while Mud returned twice more. Once in the episode I, Mud, and a second time in the episode Mud's Passion. There were plans for another episode, but Carmel was unavailable. Despite this, Carmel remains the only guest star, other than Ricardo Montalban as Khan, outside the Enterprise crew members, to face off against Kirk on more than one occasion.
Hey, hello there, what's up everybody? Adam Cleary here. Yes, I know you don't see me much anymore, but that's because I'm incredibly busy off nurturing the various creative and commercial endeavors of What Culture Limited. Anyway, one of the more exciting plays we've currently got spinning is this awesome collaboration we've got going on between us here on Trek Culture and none other than... Oh. Oh, it's in front, it's in front. Squarespace. Now, Squarespace gives you an easy to use and visually powerful online space for you to build your own website. You want a blog? They've got those. You want a portfolio space for all your work? They got them too. You want to start a dedicated newsletter where you just Photoshop my head onto the bodies of CG dinosaurs, send it out to thousands of people and call it Jurassic Park? They have, they do, they do have tools for that. You could do it. I would be vigorously prosecuting, but you could do it. Anyway, I've been working on a top secret little project on the platform lately because we are hoping to launch brand new merch stores for every single one of the What Culture channels. And Squarespace like genuinely has these amazing third party tools on top of their already amazing e-commerce capabilities. Like it manages the inventory, it promotes all the products, it pushes it all onto social media. The thing is just a dream. You're not actually supposed to be seeing any of this yet. Now that I think about it, I just, Am I taking up enough of the screen to stop you? No, I'm not. You're ruining the surprise. But yes, we are using Squarespace here at Trek Culture and you should too. So we are gonna give you some money off, your favorite. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial of the platform. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash trekculture to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. I don't like, I don't know when this is gonna be ready, so don't get too excited about the whole thing. But when it does launch, obviously you gotta, gotta try and act shocked, yeah? No, yeah, well, fair enough, it is. It's your life, isn't it? Anyway, back to the video. Number six, Core. Initially, John Colicos was not meant to be a recurring guest star when he took on the role of Kor. In fact, the Klingons were really a means to a cost-effective end in the episode Errand of Mercy. They were standing in for the much more expensive Romulans, those aliens with the prohibitively expensive ears. Therefore, Kor, with his dark face paint, burlap sash, and bubble wrap belt, was a quick and easy stand-in. Then, Kalikos delivered his performance and the producers instantly knew they wanted him back. There was an issue, however, in that he wasn't available when it came time to shoot the Day of the Dove. He was replaced by Michael and Sarah, who played Kang. Now, producers were faced with another dilemma. This actor was excellent as well. Throw in William Campbell as Koloth, and there was a revolving door of excellent bit part players. However, it was Kalikos who would eventually receive the most screen time. All three returned for Deep Space Nine's episode Blood Oath, though this would be Campbell's last appearance. And Sarah would appear once more in the Voyager episode Flashback. Kalikos, however, returned twice more, once in The Sword of Kalos, and the second time in Once More Unto the Breach. Despite his popularity, however, and the status of Deharm Master, Kalikos couldn't argue the makeup team out of giving him the ridges. That one was non-negotiable. Number four, General Martok. J.G. Hertzler was no stranger to Star Trek when he was cast in the role of the Klingon General Martok. He originally appeared in Emissary, playing the ill-fated Vulcan captain of the USS Saratoga. Though he did get a few lines in the episode's opening scenes, the role was all too short. He would return in the fourth season opener, The Way of the Warrior. Described by producers as Klingons gone nuts, The Way of the Warrior was designed to slow the advance of the Dominion War. A Klingon fleet unexpectedly decloaks around the station, taking everyone by surprise. Its commander, General Martok, is brash, direct, and deeply suspicious of the Starfleet and Bajoran officers. He immediately orders blood screenings all round. The opening episode was to have been a one and done for Hertzler, but he impressed so much that Martok was brought back for the fifth season opening, Apocalypse Rising. Here, he was revealed as a changeling. Though killed in the episode, the character brought back again, this time for real, in the two-parter In Purgatory Shadow by Inferno's Light. From there, he appeared in many more episodes for the remainder of Deep Space Nine's run. Number five, Wayoon. To explain just how much Jeffrey Combs impressed in this role, let's say only this. The entire backstory of the Vorta race, in that they were all clones, was written simply so that the producers could bring Combs back as Wayoon. He was introduced in the fourth season episode, To the Death, though he was unceremoniously killed at the end by the Jem'Hadar first Ometiklon. There was no doubt about his death, he was very clearly vaporized on screen. So when Wayun arrived on the station in the following season in the episode Ties of Blood and Water, 
everyone was a little surprised to see him. Combs had already appeared in Deep Space Nine as other characters. He played Tyran in Meridian, and of course played Liquidator Brunt in Family Business and again in Bar Association. He was no stranger to the station, which may have gone a ways to securing his recurring status. Combs oozes false positivity in every second of his screen time, and it was an absolute delight that Weyoun got to return as often as he did. Number 3. Q John Delancey was written into Encounter at Farpoint as a bit of an afterthought. The original story didn't include the Q element at all, rather the Enterprise went straight to Farpoint Station, where the adventure unfurled without any courtroom scenes. Roddenberry decided that the episode didn't have quite enough, so Q was added. Although the script clearly calls for sequels galore, there initially was no plan for Delancey to return. While the Q themselves may have been back, they could easily have been played by different actors, such as they ended up being portrayed on Star Trek Voyager. But there was something about Delancey's performance that hooked the producers and audience. He truly seemed to embody different characters as his Q moved through the different time periods of Earth's history. Based on his delivery in the pilot, Delancey was invited back for Hyden Q. Then his future was more or less solidified to a point. Morris Hurley revealed that, had it not been for the Writers Guild strike, there was to have been an entire arc for Q in the second season. Unfortunately, this was not to be, and the audience only received a little insignificant episode named Q Who. Number 2. Garrick Plain, simple Garrick first appeared in the episode Past Prologue of Deep Space Nine. Played by Andrew Robinson, this Cardassian tailor was only created to effectively play with Dr. Bashir while the young man ate his lunch on the promenade. Oh, how little they knew back then. Robinson had as much fun as he could get away with in the role, playing the man as an enigmatic, as sexual, as a predator, and as Bashir's new best friend. His part in the episode is relatively small, though it was incredibly memorable. He was quickly invited back. As the years went on, the mystery of Garrick continued to deepen and deepen. Was he really a tailor? Was he a spy? Was he a soldier? Was he really a gardener, as he claimed to have been on Romulus? The riddle that was this Cardassian was one of his most endearing traits, even when he was going through withdrawals from the drug he had used to keep himself sane on the station. While all of this was happening behind the scenes, Robinson kept his own Bible and backstory as to who Garrick really was. Once the show wrapped, he sought, and received, permission to expand this Bible into a novel, A Stitch in Time. Even in 2020, during the pandemic, Robinson joined Alexander Siddig for a virtual reunion of the two characters, with Garrick now the head of the Cardassian Union. Number 1. Miles O'Brien Colomini was originally a day player, appearing for an afternoon's work on the pilot of a new sci-fi show on the Paramount lot. Although it had the same name as it, it didn't look very much like the show that starred William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy and DeForest Kelly. But a job is a job, and in he went. It's safe to say that this was a fairly good decision on Meany's part to turn up to work that day. The producers, while not creating a backstory for him originally, liked him enough that he was invited back. He appeared in the second season where he received a first name, Miles. For the rest of the second, third, fourth and fifth seasons, Miles O'Brien would periodically appear in the show. Once Deep Space Nine was created, Michael Piller and Rick Berman chose to move the character over to the station. At this point, O'Brien began down the path that would lead him, one day, to becoming the most important man in the galaxy. There was no problem too big, no obstacle too stubborn to slow this man down. That is, except for some whitewater rapids, a kayak, and a dodgy shoulder. That's everything for our list today, guys. If you could think of any one we left off, please drop it into the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and remember that you can catch us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can catch myself at Sean Ferrick on Twitter as well. Now, whether you're just there for the afternoon or you get a little bit of a little bit of a guest spot in our lives, remember that we might be seeing you for the next 20 years. So, have some fun while you're at it and live long and prosper. Thanks, guys.